DMU, and um, her most recent book is actually sh I thought it was shop, but it's well, it's a chapbook. A chapbook. And yeah. And then Keith Taylor directs the undergraduate program at U of M and the MFA program, and directs the Bear River Writers Conference. And his most recent book is Marginalia for a Natural History and Ghost Writers. Um, and Francine Harris runs, is it Scats? Scazot. 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 <laughs> a reading series at Sweetwater, and her most recent book is Allegiance. Yeah. And Jeff Cass uh, has Knuckleheads, is his book, and he teaches at Pioneer and um, is the, the Literary Arts Program Director at the Neutral Zone, and a bunch of other fabulous things. Great poet, too, prose and poetry. Um, I just ask these guys because they, they come from different parts of the community to just come and say a few words about poetry and community. Because one thing that One Cause is trying to do is to sort of get everybody together and talking and hopefully... What? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully share resources um, anyway. So I, that's all I told them was just talk about poetry and community. So whatever you want to say about that, your experience in poetry communities or thoughts on that. So, who wanted to go first? Well, these guys are still writing down their notes, so I think they should probably, Christine's is tight now. I'm not going first, though. I've already decided that. Mine's on the back of my book. I'm really impressed that you guys wrote stuff down. Oh, I'm impressed that you guys didn't type it. No, I just had to taste it. So, they, these, these were just thoughts. I had these thoughts uh, thinking about this. It says poets and community at the top. The first, and my first thought was um, to remember the poets who flee community, who are terrified <laughs> by the idea of being in community with anyone. Um, you know, Dickinson, Rilke, uh, you know, let alone people of lesser genius whom we all know, who just are terrified the idea of having their poems out there and try talking about poetry with anybody. And I think we have to honor those people and, and say, aren't they wonderful? Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and hopefully we're going to see their poems and we're going to find. Then I thought about the poets who are in closed communities. Um, they're, they're together because of aesthetics, uh, politics, although that's not so much the case anymore. I mean, is there anyone here who knows a right-wing poet? A contemporary right-wing poet? Les Murray, but he doesn't count. He's just <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, I mean, it's just, you know, just not around anymore. But aesthetics, or schools as in Ecole de whatever, um, and, and schools even, even even we could say um, get more prosaic and say MFA programs, and then regions, um, regions being another one that is a, that could be a, a closed community. Um, and I don't think I mean, closed sounds pejorative just in and of itself. I don't think it necessarily has to be. On Wednesday night, I, I, I read with 25 other people at the Brooklyn Public Library for the 100th to celebrate the 100th issue of the magazine Hanging Loose, which is a fabulous, generous, great magazine. Um, but it's clearly a Brooklyn magazine. And there were maybe five of us who weren't from Brooklyn. Um, and everybody else was. And they all had their same jokes. And when somebody would say a street, they would all, you know, clearly have some resonance with this street that, you know, I don't know what's up on that list. Um, and, and so, you know, they had their own little region there. I mean, it's, it's been said that the most provincial place in America is New York City. Um, and I had a lovely, it was a lovely image of that. Um, Wednesday night. Uh, so then, then I have the one that's maybe closer to what Sarah was looking for. There are communities that are established, communities of like-minded people, communities established in the region, and then there are poets who find work uh, somehow sustaining and supporting that community, um, which, you know, uh, as teachers, uh, more, more like the teaching that Jeff does, because whatever skills we have as poets, are translatable to um, practical, you know, against the, 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 the popular notion of us as all the, you know, not the, the stars. Um, I mean, the things we know how to do have practical application. And, and schools and, and certain parts of communities recognize that. Um, and, and it's a kind of utilitarian aspect uh, to the role of poets and communities, which is kind of fun. And then my friend Tom Lynch says, um, has one of his many lines that he recycles over and over again. Uh, gets paid very well for saying them over and over again. He says, damn, how'd that work out? And he says, poets are like undertakers. 
Um, you don't really think about them until you need one. And, and so there's, um, you don't want to think about one until you need one. I mean, he has, he has that too. Um, and and um, if you, people still pray, you know, when Democrats get elected, they have a, you know, somebody says an inaugural poem, and, and people are always quoting poems at funerals. I mean, I think poor Jane Kennedy must be doing backflips in her grave to see how many times Let It Be Trump has been used at funerals. I don't think she thought of that as a funereal poem, but yet it's useful as one. And then there's this sort of idealistic one, a community of poets that looks going to cut across all kinds of artificial lines, um, and, and uh, that, that we're going to act generously toward one another. Um, we're going to share resources, like Sarah just said. And I, and I wonder if it's possible. Um, I'd love to see that it would be possible. I'm not sure it is, given the nature of the art that we practice. Um, but it's interesting that it would, because we are all confronted with the same essential experience when we're dealing with um, language the extremity, the, the language at the, at the edge of language. Um, so there is a similarity, I think, to what we do, no matter how it's manifested. But uh, uh, I'm more than willing to entertain that idea. That's my, that's my okay. Thanks, Keith. Sure. Yeah, Keith. <laughs> is how uh, community gets made in an academic setting um, and how it can uh, extend beyond that as well. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of our, um, I teach at Eastern, a lot of our master's students particularly coming in are working in isolation and so they're embracing this, this Emily Dickinson kind of like myth of like the romantic alienated writer who's you know self-medicating somewhere. Uh, and rarely coming out uh, into a public world. Um, so one of the things that we've done is um, in the program is institute a requirement to um, to participate in a community to basically embed yourself in a nonprofit or a public organization and devote like at least thirty hours uh, in that capacity. And, and partly that's also because I think uh, there's a kind of impoverished imagination about what to do beyond uh, a degree. So people immediately think of teaching. And frankly, like a lot of our students, you know, that's not going to be right for them. Uh, and the, the teaching market is glutted. And so thinking about ways you can make yourself useful in the community and also cultivate skills and uh, you know, realize that poetry is actually a service. You know, I mean, there you can uh, treat it in that mode. Um, so that happens at the grad level and at the undergrad level. There's a lot of community outreach that um, we encourage. And I teach a class on collaboration and community projects that also uh, weds that project of going out into the community with uh, public art. Uh, collaboration within the class that has to address um, a conceptually rich uh, con uh, set of concerns around the idea of community. And so they all go out and do projects. Like one of our, my students last semester did lots of, uh, this group did lots of research, uh, found out that Ypsilanti was once uh, well known for their underwear company, it was right on the Huron River, had a water mill, had a huge uh, woman uh, statue uh, in, a, in a union suit, uh, <laughs> and the Prince of Wales ordered his union suits from Italy. Uh, so they, they, they figured it was this model of sustainability because they used entirely water, um, the water mill energy, um, it was the highest employer of women in the area, um, and the women had this incredible sense of community. Every morning they get together and they chant these poems slash slogans, you know, uh, uh, what was one of them? Um, if love runs cold, do not despair, Ypsilanti underwear. <laughs> 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 So this group got together and they created this, um, 
they, they went through a lot of trials, but what it ended up happening was they found these huge blocks of ice on the street that were apparently discarded after a um, old folks home uh, uh, Halloween party. There were big tombstones. <laughs> Oh I know letters fan, but anyway, so so they got these big blocks of ice, and then they found letter molds, and then they wrote a lot of these slogans uh, in ice on these tombstones, and then floated them down uh, the Huron River. And it was this beautiful, and they filmed it, of course. And it's, and it was really, really gorgeous, very simple and powerful. And they all they didn't know each other beforehand, but they always still are like in contact and, and doing other kinds of projects like this. Um, so, I mean, I think a couple of things that I, I'm interested in are like how can, um, or, or, or asking students, like what is the civic role of the artist, right? Or how can we activate uh, social imagination? Um, how can, like what kinds of um, new kinds of public knowledge and empathy are possible with a post-autonomous writing practice or collaborative writing, um, how can um, language be transformative in a public setting? Uh, so these are these are kind of questions I really uh, put to my question, my my students, and, and hopefully they can uh, think through those and do it in a, a setting where they're thinking of writing as a collaborative pro uh, process, and also because we're an interdisciplinary program, it often involves other disciplines as well. Um, community kind of almost from this activist sort of uh, vision of what that looks like. So community slash commune slash neighbor, like do I have this community of poets that I get together and bake bread with or have like communal dinners on Friday and that's not really what um, I have right now. <laughs> and I've been inside those spaces before, although I think they were a little more like activist oriented. So. Um, so I think in my head, I'm trying to tease out like what a community of writers actually is. And is it somebody that's in your zip code? Is it somebody that's on your block? And I think the thing that I keep coming back to is like um, a community of poets that is, uh, or a community, a community, well, there's two different things. Like as a, as a writer, you live inside a community that is there whether they write or not, right? So how do you be productive in that community, and then the community of writers that sort of keeps you productive, I sort of feel like they're not opposed to each other, but they sort of battle each other. So for example, like I was talking to a friend of mine about this idea of, I mean the Detroit, I'm from Detroit, so the Detroit's public schools are going to shit. And so, you know, I was thinking like, what I, in, I don't know if it's like in a parallel universe or in another life, or if this is even like a remote possibility for me to get together with a bunch of people and create a, an educational alter alternative. Now that said, I realize as soon as I start thinking about it that that's a, that's a dedication, like that's a commitment to a whole lifestyle that I'm not an, I'm not an administrator, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm a, I'm a poet, I guess. So then how do you contribute to that? And then this conversation comes back to, well, we have to remember what we do. I'm thinking, well, we write poems. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sometimes we work with kids, which is kind of cool. But, and actually, I think that from the from the activist part of me to like where I am now, which is kind of a loner poet to some extent, um, I think that that is kind of the common ground for me is this idea of work, the work with kids. I feel like is the most, and and actually even some of the the lectureship stuff too. I feel like it's the most um, productive I can be. But um, I don't know, I said all that to, to say that I, I guess I'm trying to figure out like um, how, how you create a community um, and how you participate in a community without exhausting yourself or without changing your mindset so that, I mean, 
the thing about writers is a lot of us are really socially awkward. I know I am. I walked in the door and I'm like, oh god, I don't know what to say, and I'm all freaked out, and I'm usually freaked out in general, right? So the idea of being like a communal, communally effective is a little weird for us anyway. Um, <laughs> so that said, I feel like I kind of drop or dip in and out of these different communities. Some of them are closed communities, like uh, I'm a member of Kave Kanam, which is like an African American fellowship community um, that's national and diasporical, I guess, so we're sort of like in and out of different communities all over the place. Um, and that's cool, especially where it like overlaps. Um, this Gazat thing that you mentioned is a different kind of community, um, but that just feels like a place that people come together and do something really quick and then leave. Um, <laughs> I don't know, so but in terms of like productivity, I think that's sort of the thing that I sort of relish in my head, and it's weird because the thing that has been the most community-oriented, like, productive base for me, and, and on top of the MFA stuff, because I just graduated recently, is um, this email thing that I've been doing with these people for like three years, I guess now, where we, it's called The Grind, and we like email each other, pump by, and we'll commit to a month, and then it's like, it's like Namo Pomo, or Pomo Namo, or whatever it is, anyway. <laughs> so like, we'll uh, email a poem every day. I don't even know these people, I've never met them, right? But it's like, a, uh, because it changes every month, right? Like it's, it's kind of grown, it's just sort of a Warren Wilson triggered thing. Um, but then I think about like, my productivity and that is, so I don't know, I just feel like maybe community has to do with finding like that, that, that balance, like where you can be productive and where you can be uh, contributive, contributory. Contributive. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Yes. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll start by saying that I think that this is uh, actually a vital conversation. And I'm really happy to be able to have it, especially with the people who are in this room. Uh, I feel like what Sarah has done with, with One Pause to really kind of create an organization that's, that's sparking a lot of these conversations and sparking a lot of events is a really wonderful thing. Um, I think there have been a lot of poetry communities in Ann Arbor that I've sort of dipped in and out of over the years, but it's a lot of times that they feel really isolated from each other. You know, and I, and I feel like it's great that I had the opportunity to teach at Eastern with Christine and you know, do my show there, and I feel like that's a bridge that gets built. And, and Keith has been incredibly gracious to allow us to bring poetry from the neutral zone up to Bear River, and I think that is a huge bridge in the community. And we have Christine working with us at the book festival, and come to my classroom, and you know, all these kinds of things, and I think that that's really what needs to happen. Um, as a high school teacher, I, uh, I, community is, is, is what needs to be built and what institutionally is being fractured, right, by our educational policy these days. If I were to go into a staff meeting at Pioneer and say, we need to really start thinking about building community, uh, I'll get laughed out of the room, you know, I mean, it's like, it's, it's not important right now, you know, what's important is the test scores, how are they doing, and that has <coughs> nothing to do with community, that's an individual filling out bubbles, right, and, and unfortunately, that's not what the youth need in the classroom, right, they need to feel connected to each other, Lewis is in my class today, and it's so obvious when the students feel connected and respect each other, it's a better day. And when they're not, and they're, they're not uh, contributing to each other's well-being, then it, it becomes a much less positive experience for anyone. So I feel like any work we can do to build community, to build bridges between all these organizations is, is incredibly important, and, and especially for the next generation. I think all of us were lucky to go to school at a time when teaching for the test was a, it had a negative connotation. You know, that's policy now, right? Like that's that's what we're supposed to do. And I think that, that it's extremely disruptive to the, to the young people in the classroom. The strongest communities I know for young people exist um, in, in the arena of like sports, theater, and poetry. And those are the places they go. We have a hundred kids in the Ann Arbor Youth Poetry Slam every year. You know, maybe ten of them are really serious about wanting to like write. The rest of them want friends, you know, and they want people who are going to talk honestly and speak to them in a way that's um, from the heart. There's a big, there was a big uh, 
article in the, in the Times, I think, last weekend about uh, Facebook and, and Twitter and, and what does it do to a community. People think that they have communities, but they really don't. But the only community that I have online is exactly like Francine said. You know, is is thirty thirty the month of April, and I've got thirty students. You know, half of them in Ann Arbor, a third in New York, a third in San Francisco, a third in Chicago, and I'm reading their poems every night. Like, yeah, we're connected, and it's the medium um, is useful only because it's through poems, right? If it wasn't that, it'd be really superficial and interesting. But the fact that we get to read. I mean, if I read 30 poems from a kid over a course of a month, I know that person, you know, and they know me, and it's like, now it's a different kind of relationship, right? So I think that all we do is important, and I think that we need to do more. Uh, everybody talks about the state of the book, or literacy, or, you know, reading or writing, or whatever, but I think that we all know that what poetry really gets to is, you know, the human condition. It gets to our ability to connect to other people, our ability to have empathy, all those things that are, you know, so much more important than a book getting published or whatever. It's just about how are we understanding each other, right? And if that gets excised from the curriculum the way it's getting excised, then we need to step in as a community outside of the public schools and build those communities for young people and for ourselves. And I think the price of us failing to do that is, is heavy, really heavy. Um, I, I, I have a vision that I, what I would really like to see happen is to see you know, a, a major Midwest poetry festival in Ann Arbor, um, something on the, on the scale of a Dodge Poetry Festival. And I think it can happen. I think it can happen if the people in this room are interested. There's enough of us here, and we have enough connections that if we want to do that, we can do it. And I think that that would be something that would be really wonderful <coughs> to really see um, our community said that this is important to us. You know, it matters. And it does, you know, I think that um, Francine has worked with an organization in Detroit uh, called Inside Out, which is, in my mind, one of the premier youth organizations in the country that works with young people. Um, we have very strong programs at the Neutral Zone, and I, and I feel like, obviously, the MFA program in Michigan is tremendous. And there's, there's enough power here that if we really join forces, I think that we could, you know, and, and Eastern, I think, is also incredible. I think that if we all join forces, you know, we can do some really wonderful things. You know, I, I, I may be an idealist, but I think poetry saves the world. I do think that. And I think that, you know, we need to make sure we keep it alive and keep it vital in the hearts and minds of the community. And it's up to us to do it, because, you know, the, the governor ain't going to help us. You know, <laughs> it's for us. I just started volunteering here tonight, and I've been to a couple yeah, of things, and yeah. I'm here for community um, and for how convenient. And I noticed I was in a MFA program in San Francisco, and what I found is, you know, even a year after people finish, finish up their MAs or MFAs, do they still write poetry? And the answer is no. Most people, 95, maybe more percentage of people, people that I've known that write really well, don't write. And I think part of that might have to do with the community is broken, that a, that a university setting facilitates community and then when when that structure is taken away, there's nothing to move into. And, um, and I think it's tragic for people to um, to dive into to, to writing and uh, connect with it and, and be there and then not be able, and, and not write afterwards. Uh, anyone have any ideas. How do we fix that? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, I mean the, the, the line that I try to say when both both uh, undergraduates and, and graduate students do that, I mean, if, if you can go out there and do this when, when it's very clear that the world doesn't care whether you do it or not, uh, that's some kind of ultimate test. Because, you know, there really are, the, the amount of rewards that are available to us are so, so uh, you know. Well, to me, the reward is writing. Exactly. And I can't, you know, write, I can't the, write alone. The, the, the rewards outside of anything internal are yeah. so are so there are so few of them. Um, and and I mean I don't have I don't have an answer to that. And I mean I kind of yeah. wish why do we just 
waste all these resources on somebody for two or three years and they're never going to write another poem. But I do think that some of those, I mean, I'm just thinking about like my cohort, the people I went to school with, and in my brain I'm thinking like, well, who are these folks going to be in like five or ten years? And I think some of them will be editors, because I can just tell. They have like a really good ear, they're interested in what other folks are doing, they're very supportive, right? Um, they may not be writing. Some of them will be in administrative positions, a lot of them are interested in education. So I sort of feel like at least in that pool is a possibility for a connection. Plus they're writing or not. I also think you can, within a school structure, empower students to start making those uh, connections on their own so they don't have to rely on the authorities to do it for them. So they, yeah. you know, publication is like a, the creation of a public. And so if you're publishing amongst yourselves, uh, in alternative ways, as well as giving readings and organizing yourselves, then that's you know that that's what's going to perpetuate uh, the feeling of community. In my own situation, I think it was the lack of authority. Like where I got my MFA, the you know like they disappeared. It was at Columbia University. They just sort of like reabsorbed into the city like immediately after class. Like you never saw them. They didn't right. office hours. You know? <laughs> they came, they did their thing and they were gone. So it really the you know is is kind of incapacitating as that was in some ways, it was great for the creation of student community. Because we're like, fuck them, you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, this. Yeah. I, I do think the post MFA malaise is real. You know, I think that it, it's very hard um, I think for a number of people, because especially if you have like a series of deadlines, your workshop, and, and you're getting validation, even if it's not publication, you're getting affirmed that you're a writer, and all of a sudden that's all gone. You're like, well, am I a writer? You know, why did I just do that? Um, for me, you know, I I'm constantly challenged because I'm working with 100 plus writers every single day. You know, and I have to be fresh with them, and I have to show them they're like, I can't read the same poems I've been reading even a few months ago. You know, so it's got to be like new stuff. And, and all that. And, but I do think also that one of the most, I agree with Christine, like one of the most valuable things that happened to me in the MFA program was um, working with like one of my mentors over here, Lewis, is just that, uh, you know, I think at some point I felt that what I was really learning more than anything was how to trust myself, you know, and not feel like I had to rely on somebody else to say this is good, this is working, but feel like I could find my own sense of my work that, yeah, that's good. I like it. I'm good enough to like it. And now I can just go on. If it gets published, fine. But I trust my own voice, yeah. and I think that's what helps me get over the hump. And if they don't ever get that trust because they come too dependent on their professors or their colleagues, then I think that's when the problem. Is. So you know, as an instructor, I try to do that. My students, I know that I think really good instructors try to do that at some point. Like, I don't know if it's like a weaning process, but sort of like you know, right. you got to trust yourself. Is there is there a place in, in uh, one pause um, poetry for Kind of an outreach to MA, MA, you know, PA um, high school students. I don't know. Well, we did just did this high school poetry contest, which we're going to have the winners on Monday. Uh -huh. And um, we have uh, Christine's students who are in that community class have been volunteers here That's and great. interns. For better and worse. No, they're great. They're great. <laughs> yeah. the great ones. And Audra does all the postcards here, and she's an MFA student now. And um, so, I'm, yeah, that there great. is this kind of. I mean, one thing that I want to say, which is, when I went here as an MFA, there was a Shaman John bookstore and the original borders. And for me, I found community just going into those exactly. places yeah. and looking at all those books and spending hours. And that just doesn't really exist anymore. And so, you know, you have to find another way to, to do that and to see, like, how to make that happen. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping, like, going to readings is another way to do that. Going to different things that are happening to Yeah, Claudette? I'd just like to throw in a real wrench because most of what we touch upon here has to do with either education or academia. And I come from a more, more renegade mode of community and I wanted to end school when I was 16. And instead of dropping out, I speeded it up and graduated when I was 17. And I knew that you know, poetry was going to be the fulcrum of my life, but I also knew that other arts would be as well. So I set out to find the community that would bind books with me, that would write poetry, that would share poetry. I love, you know, typesetting and typing faces, and in those days, you know, we didn't have computers. So, you know, there was a very 
different community. I landed in Northern California and you know experienced city lights and you know all the wonderful bookshops that they had there and found you know a community of bookbinders and started buying you know my trade and I started my first small press in the 70s there. And the thing was I never had an interest in teaching or or education in a conventional sense. I have a great interest in in education, but I think we've created a box and we need to get out of it. And Detroit is certainly an area where that um, holds true. But I um, I truly was interested in what comes of um, all of the piece when I created something from start, and that doesn't it doesn't matter to me if that's a piece of sculpture um, or a book, and that's always sort of been my drive and also encouraging people to do that. So that kind of particular underground community of creativity and exchange and, um, I don't know, just support, because it is really supportive, at least for me when you're outside of academia, when you're within it, it's a very different thing, and I'm not saying that it's wrong. But I'm just saying that there's another way of, of going about that that, um, for me, I find a great deal of comfort and enjoyment in and uh, have found that it really, you know, for years, has just nourished me in a way that um, is easy to find in whatever community that I go into. So it's just yeah, another nice. perspective of mine. Thanks. I, I just wanted to add to a couple of things that people have been saying, and, and one, well, the first thing is talking about this sort of MFA malaise that happens after, and this sort of you know dependency thing that happens with, and it's really important to 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 know that your voice is important, and secondly that the MFA community or publishing or editing is not the only thing happening in the world. What happens is it becomes this really close, really sort of tight community where they refuse to look at anything outside of that community. So we could be talking like this forever, but there are people who just don't know this kind of stuff and won't sort of refuse to know it. There are people who refuse to acknowledge Detroit exists. So, you know, it's like we need to make that happen more. And I think this is a great opportunity to, you know, keep working at that. And secondly, there are other communities that exist within this community, which is all the writers groups that exist, whether it's at Arbaland, Barnes and Nobles, through Springfed Arts. There are various, various groups that <coughs> get together and really write good stuff. And uh, there are people who've done their MFA years ago who have had children and now want to come back to writing. And they're publishing again. So there are other very uh, vibrant maybe small communities, but very, very vibrant communities in the Detroit area, in metro Detroit area, and in, within Ann Arbor. And I've uh, been very happy to know many of these uh, people who come in for all the events that happen in Ann Arbor. There's a writing series, EMU series, the bathhouse series there. They go and visit. So there is a community, and I think we need to pull them in, not, you know, sort of say, this The only thing I would add to that, and this is what Deb's saying to you, too is because uh, I mean I've been a part of all those and I was part of all those before I climbed into the bathroom window and got a job here. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, but but those communities are, are can be equally as close. Mm -hmm. I mean they want to go and hear a reader or you know whether that reader is you know, some academic poet or some mm -hmm. people or whatever. But they don't want to sit around and talk to us you know, either. They they have their group and they're very happy in their group. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, that's that closed community is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and, and, I mean, I don't think we can just say we're going to invite them and they're going to show up. You know? No, but they're the ones who do show up for a lot of the things. They, they show up for a lot of things. No, I mean, they do. But so do you. So do I. But that's what I'm saying. These things are good to have because they're pulling in people yeah. from all these smaller communities. Right. Well, I mean, I think, again, I think it's on us. I mean, I think Sarah's made some really great inroads. And sort of creating almost like a clearinghouse for a lot of these community organizations yeah. with the with the calendar and everything like that. But I mean, I think this this Gazette reading is exactly what um, we talk about. Like that, I mean, it's a community-based reading. You know, it's a reading that people can just walk in off the street and read an open mic. And I mean, we don't have an Ann Arbor Poetry Slam anymore, but that's what that used to be too, and that's where it came from. 
You know, I know like we talk about like sometimes that word slam puts people off, but that really was, and the slam at, at its heart is a democratic mm -hmm. place that anybody can step up to that microphone. You just got to put your name on the list, right? You have your three minutes. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, I know that there are slam poets who feel like, well, the MFA programs give us no respect, right? And of course, I think that's changing because you're starting to see some big time performance poets, you know, get their MFA and, and creep into the academic circles. I would say Patricia Smith is probably the number one representative of that, but, um, you know, and then there, of course, there are, there are slam poets who are like, oh, you have an MFA? You're, you're writing that boring, dead shit, don't come near me, mm -hmm. right? And that's the, that, I think that's regrettable on both ends, when all we're all trying to do is work with language and, and work with trying to connect to each other. Mm -hmm. And then I think Zilk is absolutely right, that there are all kinds of communities in Ann Arbor where we needed some kind of mechanism to draw them all together, you know? And, and when we do big shows at the, the, uh, the Michigan Theater or whatever, not the Michigan, but like uh, Rackham, and we're pulling 600 high school kids, but there's no MFA students coming, you know, and there's only, the only students from Eastern coming are the ones that are in my class or, you know, something like that, then, I, you know, I feel like we all should be somehow making this work better, you know, that we should all somehow figure out how to open the doors so that all of us can enter in collectively. And I'm not sure how to do that, but I think that's the goal. You know? I think it also, um, I mean, just thinking about only a writing community is a little bit insular as well. And, you know, the, the danger of a creative commons is that it creates this kind of consensual atonality, you know, so everything is homogenized to a certain degree. And reaching out to other kinds of, you know, art artistic communities is also super fruitful. In terms yeah, but we get to do this, you know. Yeah. Look up and see the drawings of the skulls. It's cool. <laughs> well, um, I'm so glad that we're having this conversation, and I think we should keep having it. But let's just maybe make it informal now and get back to the party. Yeah. <laughs> and I want to thank all of you guys, you, panelists, sir. and thank you all for coming and listening. And